Sorry, I forgot to hit record. Um, and my co-host is Michael Tizzoli, who is the CEO of West Bergen. And we put on these shows uh, really to help not only the Ramsey community, but the community at large dealing with um, the pandemic. That's really where it started. And I want to thank Michael and West Bergen for their relationship with Ramsey. Uh, he has been a blessing and um, their organization has helped us pre-pandemic and I know they're going to uh, be there for us post-pandemic. Michael, how are you? I am really well, Matthew. How are you doing? Well, there is no snow this week, Michael. So in the superintendent <laughs> pandemic world, the snow was like just yeah, I know. I you know, know. Digging, dig, it was digging deep, Michael. I'm not going to lie to you. That snow <laughs> just was over the top <laughs> during that year. But <laughs> I understand. Uh, and, but, you know, luckily, uh, as a superintendent of schools, you have nothing else going on. So no, I don't know no, 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 no. Yeah. So um, that, that's a little disappointing to hear that the, the snow that, that pushed you over. <laughs> it was great because, I mean, I'm a skier and, uh, and I love snow, but it was just some cruel jokes at time about the, the snow. And, and, and I'm going to say it over again. I love the fact that weathermen can put out or whether, you know, the, whether people can put out forecasts from zero <laughs> to 10 feet and they walk away clean, you know, <laughs> and I, I, I'm there out there and you know where I live, Michael saying, snow, I canceled school. It better snow, it better <laughs> snow, or I didn't cancel snow, snow and I'm pushing <laughs> the snow away. But you talk about being inaccurate and they get away with it. Holy cow. But I'm glad you're well, Michael. I am really well. Survived the snow for sure. As uh, as you might have guessed, um, skiing is not my thing. <laughs> so um, I, I prefer to be inside during the snow and um, try to count whether I should, you know, is it four marshmallows in the hot chocolate, three marshmallows in the hot chocolate? That's about what I do during a, a winter storm. So uh, I'm envious of people actually that, that get out there on two pieces of fiberglass and slide themselves down the side of a mountain. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's great. And I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Frank Cilio, uh, who is our honored guest today. And um, Frank, why don't you give, a give us a little introduction? Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, glad to be part of this and thank you you know, Ramsey School District, and thank you, Wes Bergen, for inviting me. I am a licensed psychologist in Ridgewood. I'm in Ridgewood, actually, now. This is actually my, my office. I haven't been here almost a year. Um, March 16th was the last time I saw patients here in Ridgewood, and um, been doing telehealth since, and um, maybe eventually getting back into my office, which is why, you know, one of the things I miss about doing therapy is being with people and that's the relationship is really important. But I've been practicing in Ridgewood for over 25 years and um, I got my doctorate at Fordham University. And in addition to um, being a psychologist is uh, another aspect of my professional career is I speak across the country and I am an author of 12 children's books Welcome. and one parenting book for parents with kids with chronic medical illnesses. And that just came out uh, this month. And I'm always cultivating some more books, um, something I just love to do and speak across. That's kind of stopped this year of speaking and traveling um, and about you know psycho psychology and different topics. So um, I work with children, I work with adolescents, and then I work with adults. And I enjoy very much what I do. That's great. I just realized we have three Fordham grads on this uh, panelist. Indeed. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, a, a little uh, Frank can tell us what that means psychologically. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right. We are we're so happy to have you here tonight. It's uh it's really special, um, and I, and I share that uh, two two reasons. One. Um, Frank is a, um, a, a gifted clinician and a, 
uh, a trusted uh, member of our professional community. I am uh, pleased, equally pleased though, to say that Frank is a good friend. And so I can let you behind the curtain a little bit and let you know that Frank's a really good person. <laughs> and so I always find that uh, great clinicians that are great people have great outcomes when they touch their clients. And so I know that uh, you, are, you are part of that community. Um, and by the way, I love the children's books behind you. I love the, the um, oh, covers. You. They're, just, they're just colorful and, and connected and um, fun. I love that. That's a neat, uh, a neat way to remember. I would imagine blood, sweat, and tears that would go into, uh, into writing and kind of book. So That's a lot of work, but thank you for all your kind words. I, you got the check I sent you about. So. <laughs> well, Frank, I've known the man eight years. He hasn't said anything close about it like that about me. Eight years, eight years I've been waiting. <laughs> I'm slow to trust. It's just, <laughs> it's an issue. <laughs> so we are, we are really happy tonight to have uh, Frank join us this evening. And Frank, you're going to be um, sharing some thoughts on how to manage anxiety during this uh, kind of COVID time. What I think is uh, particularly interesting about the way that uh, you go about your presentations, and as you mentioned, you, uh, you do this all over the country, um, I find that your presentations are incredibly practical. <laughs> so some of us in our field, I might be one of them, we get a little lost in theory and all kinds of lingo. And um, I've always been impressed with, uh, Frank, with your ability to um, be so practical to a point where a parent, a child, anyone can really leave that, this presentation. And you will have your pen and your piece of paper, and I promise you, you will leave with some uh, practical advice. So thank you for uh, putting the time and energy into that and for uh, joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Sure. So go right ahead, Frank, if you want to start to share some of your thoughts, whatever, however you want to approach is great with us. So we, you know, thank you. We are in, you know, the United States of anxiety. And we've been in the United States of anxiety for quite some time, even before pandemic. It's the number one mental health concern for adults and for kids. We've got 40 million American adults that are diagnosed with anxiety disorder. 32% are teenagers. And only a third of those diagnosed with anxiety disorders seek treatment. So that's a really low number compared to you know, the, the prevalence of anxiety disorders. And I'm not gonna bore everyone with statistics because that would, at this hour of the night, everyone will use it for sleep, but it just kind of shows you the volume of you know, this anxiety you know, that pervades our culture. And it's not just COVID related. It was, you know, they, the APA, the American Psychological Association did a survey and it was healthcare, politics, health, you know, all other kinds of health issues, um, violence, and gun violence in schools. So we live in a very anxious time. And uh, I'm seeing it exacerbated now in my practice with kids and adults that had anxiety maybe before and, you know, or are developing anxiety symptoms. Certainly, if you know someone who is experiencing anxiety, a um, family member, a friend, it's important to reach out, especially for kids, because if we don't address anxiety in childhood, it can develop into long in, into anxiety into adulthood, depression, substance abuse, suicide. So it's really important that we, <clears throat> hopefully, working toward non-stigma, and we can, you know bring people to get services. Not everyone needs therapy. And I'm gonna talk about different ways of getting help for anxiety. Great, <clears throat> big, uh, big, big help, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm, as, the, as the CEO of a, of a mental health center, the, uh, the statistic that you did sort of slip in there that bothers me, that wakes me up at night is the one third. So right of, of this gigantic group of folks that are um, struggling, only one third are reaching out. How do you approach um, clients that come in for that one third? And, and I, I, I don't even know what to say in terms of what the three of us and maybe everyone else on this call could, um, could put our heads together to get that number up. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's it is normalization. I think there's, you know, everyone feels like they're the only one experiencing anxiety or stress or depression. And that 
no one is really alone. There's a common humanity here that we all share in this pandemic, even myself. And I will disclose that, you know, it's hard doing telehealth therapy. It's hard being home all the time. You know, this has affected everyone. COVID was basically a pebble in a still pond that had rippling effects that go out in lots of areas. So when people feel, which often people come to my office and perhaps your office and other offices with some degree of shame and helplessness and, and, and embarrassment about it, is that understanding that we are not alone in this. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That, that certainly does. That would break down the barrier mm. for sure. All kinds of reasons for that, but uh, I definitely uh, appreciate that. You, you talk about this sort of concept, and, and I know you've, you've done this before, in terms of uh, dealing or dwelling. I love this, by the way. Can you, can yeah. you fill us in on that? Well, like, you know, we have to ask ourselves, are we dealing with whatever we are, what is placed in front of us in our lives? Or are we just dwelling on it? Are we just thinking about it? Are we, you know, just, okay, I'll do that tomorrow and procrastinating it. How do we learn to deal? How do we as adults learn how to deal with whatever comes our way? And how do then we translate that to kids? Whether it's dealing with anxiety disorder, whether it's dealing with school issues, whether it's dealing with bullying, whether it's dealing with being at home and homeschooling and isolation. So how are we going to deal? And hopefully tonight, maybe I'll, I will give you some tools and people listening and watching some tools to move forward and learn to deal as opposed to dwell in this area of helplessness or hopelessness or inertia. And so I ask people to think about what is your plan? What is your plan moving forward after tonight? for example. So PLAN, I believe, stands for, it's an acronym for putting life into action now. Putting life into action now. Not tomorrow, not next week. As tax season approaches, we're all maybe in that state of mind of like, oh, I'll uh, get to that, you know, over the weekend. Or the whole Scarlett O'Hara thing from Gone with the Wind. I'll think about that tomorrow putting life into action now. So hopefully, you know, that we can be proactive as opposed to reactive to problems that are coming into our families, into our lives. We can't, we can't foresee everything that's going to happen. And with, with, with COVID over the past year, it's been that on the edge of your seat, like breaking news all the time, right? And I, I, I say to my patients, I'm like, COVID has been sort of like taking, we're, I'm assuming we're all from New Jersey here, but, it's like flying to Florida, which is a two hour flight. You're on the flight for two hours. You're like, oh, great, we'll be there in two hours, no problem. All of a sudden, you know, the captain gets on, on the intercom and says, um, we have a delay. We'll now be there in three hours. And you are like, okay. And then, okay, three hours, I can do that. And then you hear again, oh, now it's gonna, we're delayed again. And it's just like constantly, when, is, when are we gonna land? When are we going to land this plane and feel like we're gonna put our feet on the ground again? And I hear this all the time, like, am I doing something wrong for my kids? Am I, am I, what's gonna happen to my kids when, they, when they're growing up? Like my kids are young now, what are they gonna be like as teenagers? What are they gonna be like when they're in their twenties? And in my practice, I get to see, I see as young as three in my practice through adulthood. So my teenagers are dealing with teen issues, my young adults, how do I date in this time? You know, my, my, my couples are, how do we connect? We're both, we're always on top of each other. They've never spent more together time, right? So we don't know really the long-term effects of depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder perhaps, of what this pandemic might mean for us in the future. But I feel hopeful with things rolling out and things happening that, you know, once things start to get into the, you know, we're learning all this new vocabulary too, synchronous learning, asynchronous learning, you know, new normal, all these phrases that I, you know, we never had in our, our, our vocabularies before. So it's really, you know, learning a whole different way of being, which change creates anxiety. If you have a child who has problems with transitions, they're going to have a more difficult time because it, it's, you know, very hard for them to make some of these transitions in, in typical times, now in these times. However, I have observed kids adjusting better to some degree to this pandemic than adults. They will mask up, they will not question it, they will get in line, they will respect social distancing. 
where it's sometimes I've experienced the resistance of the parents sometimes doing that. So it's interesting. Maybe kids are just because they're younger or they're rule followers and they want to please or they are kind of the school rules. They get maybe a little bit easier. I mean, we have a lot more experience and so we, we feel like maybe we're missing out on more. I don't know, but it's an interesting observation that I have experienced in my clinical work. It really is. That's a, that's a really interesting uh, comment. I hadn't, hadn't really thought about that. That's an excellent, excellent point. Yeah, in terms of the difference. And, and it really has been a, a, a marked difference in some ways. What do you think the relationship, let me say it differently, how do you help parents, families kind of manage that? How do you help them kind of deal with their stressed out child? And I, and I know that this sort of, is it stress? Is it depression? Is it anxiety? How do you differentiate those? Should we even care about differentiating those? Yeah. Well, we know stress is a reaction to some external event, like, you know, a test deadline, a medical test, but usually stress will abate after that medical test is passed. Anxiety is more persistent and lasts longer. And so, you know, diagnostically, obviously someone who's stressed, we're all, we all, you know, we can, we can, we're all stressed even before a pandemic. We live in Bergen County or we, we work in New York City. That's just stress, you know? And so we can have, you know, we can't be stressed less. We can have less stress though. So it's looking at, and I have in my office, I don't have it here, but behind me is a scale. It's a lawyer scale. And people often say, why do you have a lawyer scale? You're not a lawyer. But what it represents in my office to my kids and to my adults is that most people come to my office, not because they have mental illness of some sort or shame about that, is because they're out of balance. And so therapy is about finding what, where's your balance in your life? And as a parent, you know, how do we find balance in these times that we're home all the time and the kids are coming to us with math problems that we never wanted to do in the first place. How do we balance all that stuff out? Um, and so balance is really important. And, and some of the obvious like diet and you know, watching what you eat and exercising and getting adequate sleep, bringing some of the old normal into the new normal in, you know, in the sense of getting dressed for work or getting dressed and putting cologne on or putting makeup on, feeling a sense of, of, of kind of typical. And that's happening more and more as the country is opening up. But we also, you know, the one thing that most people struggle with is the social piece. It's missing social connections with people and they're tired of Zooms. I mean, we're all suffering from pandemic fatigue and <clears throat> another buzzword that we never talked about before or buzz phrase, um, you know, and the snow exacerbated all this stress for people because we're all inside and now all of a sudden we've got three feet of snow and it's like people can't get out and go for a walk or <clears throat> you know they're even more of that cagey feeling so <clears throat> it's very hard um and i and i always encourage parents not to neglect their own physical mental social emotional spiritual needs because kids are looking to us they're looking to parents, they're looking to therapists, they're looking to educators and say, okay, how are you handling this? Because if you're losing it, this is you know, going to be potentially, they're gonna mirror that. And that's a lot of pressure for parents as well. But it's also important for parents to acknowledge, this is hard to tell your four-year-old or five-year-old, this is hard, or to your teenager, it's hard on me too. There's a shared empathy there. There's a shared humanity there that we are all as a family together, and you know, at times it's stressful and I'm sick of having dinner or making dinner or whatever, or wiping things down or whatever that might be, whatever the rituals are. So I think that, <clears throat> I think it's important that we remember balance. And there's many ways that creating tools, and I wanna talk about creating a toolbox for anxiety, because I think that if you, if you were doing re home renovations on your house and you hired a carpenter, if he or she only had a hammer in the toolbox, they would be a very limited carpenter, correct? Right? They might botch up your house. Yeah, big time. So, so, you know, the important thing is like keeping, what kind of tools can we use? So as I mentioned, nutrition and exercise and sleep and um, getting outside and all those things. But for certain things, and I'm gonna be talking about different tools for different ages. So, so 
for kids, I, I suggest to some parents to set up worry time um, where you have a certain amount of the time of the day, 15 minutes to talk about anything that you're anxious about. When the timer goes off, you have to learn to compartmentalize that anxiety or those worries until the next day. And so what it does is it, it doesn't have the anxiety kind of like spread out all over the day. It compartmentalizes it. I encourage for young kids to create a worry box or parents to create a worry box with their kids and they can make, get a shoe box or any kind of box. God knows everyone's got a ton of Amazon boxes, I'm sure at their houses at this point. So they could, they can make a worry box and you decorate it and, and kids can write and parents can write what their worries are and they put them in the worry box. And it, again, it kind of pushes it away for the moment so they can sleep and do their work. And then you could take it out at a neutral time for them to talk about. Um, we can engage in breathing. And I know that breathing is sort of for lots of people is, I don't know, they're like, they roll their eyes when you say, take a breath. If you think about it, our breath is the most portable app we have. It's always with us. And if we don't have it, then we're not here, right? So we need to learn to take lots of different breaths. We can learn to take what I call, what I don't call it, but what they call four squared breathing, or it's called box breaths. And so you breathe into the count of four, hold for the count of four, breathe out to the count of four, wait to the count of four, and do that four times. So breathe in to the count of four, hold for the count of four, breathe out to the count of four, and do that four, and wait four seconds and then do it four times. When I work with people who are in the um, armed forces or um, first responders or police officers, I teach seven eleven breaths. So that's breathing in to the count of seven and breathing out to 11. And that's often used for people in crisis situations. We also, for young kids, we also have another portable, well, we have a, we all have a portable, this portable app, but it works well for kids. Finger breaths. We can breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Or we can hold our hands and trace up, breathe in, hold it, breathe out. Breathe in, hold it, breathe out. And sometimes we have to do five finger breaths. Sometimes we have to do 10. And some parents have to do 15 or 20. And it doesn't matter. It's sometimes what, what happens in these situations is kids and adults, we get, we get emotionally dysregulated because we're stressed. And so we need to check ourselves. We need to not only check into our breath, we need to check into our bodies. That's what mindfulness is. Mindfulness isn't about oming and wearing Birkenstocks and that kind of thing. Mindfulness is about noticing, noticing what you feel, what you think, what your body sensations are. So when you're angry, where do you feel it? Do you feel it in your gut? Do your hands start to get tense? Does your face start to get warm? So mindfulness is about noticing. And we know with mindfulness, it's meditation and breathing and yoga, which is mindfulness in motion. So seven, 11 breaths, four square breathing, you know, five, five finger breaths. There's also a breath called the lung hana breath. And the emphasis is on the exhale. Let me say that again. It's the lung hana breath and the emphasis is on the exhale. So you breathe in normally and you're slow on the exhale. When you do it that way, it brings your energy down. Now say your child is doing, you know, did lunch and is, you know, tired and has had enough homework you want, or you're tired, you want to bring your energy up. So you reverse it. The emphasis again is on the exhale. You breathe in slow and breathe out fast. And that will bring your energy up. And that's called the Langana breath. We also, what I do with my patients during this time of, you know, when, you know, we feel very deprived or we feel very frustrated with not being able to go to our favorite restaurant or not being able to hug our moms or not being able to attend school is I encourage journal writing. 
journaling is a great way to let out stress and anxiety because it's like no filter. It's like, just put your stuff that's, you know, circling in your head onto paper. And it's amazing what people start to uncover by rereading re their journal. Like, wow, I didn't know I felt that way. I had no idea that I was thinking about that. And it really also helps people solve problems because it's active. You're not just sitting there, you know, dwelling in your head, going back to the dealing or dwelling. The dealing would be journal writing. The dwelling would just be ruminating over and over in your head about something. I also encourage people to keep gratitude journals or to discuss gratitude. I tell people, think of three big G's and three small G's. So three big G's could be your home, your health, your family. Three small G's could be a warm blanket, a comfy pajama, a nice meal. And it's a great thing that families can do over dinner to foster gratitude. Because the research shows with gratitude, when we foster gratitude, we do have less anxiety, less depression. It's also a great tool I give to couples when people come to me for marital therapy or even parents, before you go to bed, turn to your partner and name three big G's and three small G's. And you may say the same ones every night, that's okay. Cause let's, in this time of COVID, if we have our health, we should be grateful for that. If our family is still with us, we should be grateful for that every day. And so I, I love the idea of gratitude and you could journal about it as well. You don't have to share it. You could just write about it. And so you can keep a regular journal. And the journal doesn't have to be, by the way, Dear Diary, today I had eggs for breakfast. It doesn't have to be that kind of way. It could just be words. It could be drawings. It could be for kids. It could be doodles. It could be whatever they want to use it for. So that's another way of another tool in the toolbox. You may want to look into some phone apps. There's a great mindfulness phone app called Insight Timer. It's free, free is good. And it has timed meditations and guided meditations and music, soothing music that I often play sometimes with my patients in my office as, as I'm doing play therapy. Before pandemic, I would do play therapy and I would play some relaxing music and I would see my patients who were anxious and or acting out that they would settle in and calm down. And so there is something to be said about soothing music. And, but if their music happens to be ACDC or you know, some rap group, if it speaks to them, great. If it helps to them to relax, fantastic. We have to use what speaks to them. I, was one, I once told one of my students who I, I supervised his doctorate, as I said, find the melody of your patient and sing along with them. And I always say to my students, you know, I'm going to give you some tools, but I want to talk to you about the most important tool that you'll, that you're going to ever need to know. And they grab their pen and they're very, you know, oh, wait, wait, what's the word of wisdom? The best tool that they and parents and caregivers give to kids and to ourselves is us. We are the greatest tool that we bring to people our relationship with our, our children, our relationship with our spouses, significant others, our relationship with our neighbors, our teachers, our administrators. Use the relationship you have with them and that will go really far. It may sound very corny, but when I do behavior mod systems with little kids, they don't care about the trinket. Maybe they do for five minutes, but what they really want is time with mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. They want that special time. And that helps to reduce stress and anxiety in kids because they, our job is to keep kids safe. And so if we don't, if they don't feel like they're being safe in some way, their anxiety is going to go up. Sometimes they're going to act out because they're feeling anxious. And so it's not like they're being defiant. Maybe underneath all that is they're anxious about something. They're anxious about the world. Some of us leave the news on 24 seven, not a healthy thing for anyone to do. And so um, we need to be aware of, of those things and how they affect kids. We can engage in, you know, an exercise that I like to do with, with my kids who are anxious and some of my adults 
um, as I said, my parenting book is on, is on for parents with kids with chronic medical illness, cancer, diabetes, asthma, Crohn's disease. They often have to go to doctor's appointments and they get anxious about shots, even getting the COVID test, getting now eventually getting the COVID vaccine. As I say, tap into five senses, into your five senses. Name five things you can see. Name four things you can hear. Name three things you can touch. Name two things you can smell and one thing you can taste. And you can vary those up. So you could do five things you see, five things you hear, whatever works. But it helps orient you, your child, whoever, back into the present moment and get them out of their head. What mindfulness teaches us, Michael, is that to stay in the present moment. When we live in the past, that's where remorse, regret, and depression lives. Not a fun place to be. When we are living in the future, that's where anxiety lives. Not a fun place to be. So the anxiety of the future is the what ifs. The depression of the regret and remorse of the past is what was. I ask people to deal with what is. Right? During in the beginning of the pandemic, what if they run out of toilet paper? What if, what if we don't get a vaccine? When, what if we never get back to school? What is in my control now? Because I have to let go of the other stuff. Does that make sense? No. So. That's interesting, Frank, because I'm seeing now with the light at the end of the tunnel a little bit with the vaccine, um, parents are getting anxious about when are we getting back to normal? When, you know, even though we're still at a very high uh, rate of, uh, in our region, they're very anxious to, to get back to normal. That's their million dollar question for me. When will this be over? When will our, all our kids be back to school? Mm -hmm. So that I can, I can hear and see that living in the future is, is, is um, raising naturally, you know, parents' anxiety. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and it's hard, you know, and that's where the breath comes in because the breath brings us right back into the here and now, into the center focus. There's a couple of tools also that some practical things that you can maybe have in, in children's rooms or, you know, classrooms or in my office, I have these things to remind kids about some, some breathing or mindfulness exercises. This is called a Hoberman sphere, and I call this a breathing ball. And I have this behind my chair when I sit with patients. And so it teaches them to breathe. It's tactile. They can hold on to this. They can see it, and it mirrors the lungs. You can take a pipe cleaner and buy some beads and put two, two knots on the end, and these become breathing beads. So breathe in, move the bead up breathe out, move the beat up. And you can you could go back and forth with this. So when, when, you, when you have young children, I mean, I don't know if your teenager would do this, but you know, once you hold something and when you, it, or it's something that um, they can you know, see, hold, you know, and engage all senses, they're more of a buy-in of maybe calming down. You can create a mindfulness jar which is basically a plastic jar, hot water in here first and clear glue and glitter. And so I explain mindfulness to kids and adults like this. So this is your brain and all these glittery things are your thoughts and feelings swirling around. But watch what happens when we, we pause and we just calm ourselves down through breathing. What starts to happen to the glitter? It starts to go down. Now, the glitter, the feelings and the thoughts will still be there, but they're settled down. And so you can, you can make these with kids and you can make them in different colors. Like this one is anger because it's red. So as long as they're not throwing it at you, you can have these available so that they can use them as tools. Pinwheels, who sees pinwheels anymore, right? But great for kids. And I've had teenagers bring in pinwheels to my office to just, Take a breath and it's a, it's a manipulative. And lastly, you can use 
you can use, you know, a, a paper towel holder or a um, toilet paper holder. And gosh knows we have a lot of toilet paper holders because there's no, you know, hardly, you know there was no toilet paper on the shelves for a while. So people have stocked up on them is that you can decorate these with kids and they can use it to breathe in and breathe out. They can feel their breath. Is it hot? Is it cold? And it's just ways of, again, engaging kids these exercises may be for more young children than teenagers. With teenagers, mindful walking, mindful eating, eating slowly, those kinds of things. Jenga, Jenga is a popular game that I play and I, you know, you put on the Jenga. Does everyone know, I hope everyone knows what Jenga is. It's like all these blocks and you push them through and you hope that the whole thing doesn't go crashing down. Um, and you can write words on them. And so it improves focus and concentration, but it also settles the body and settles the mind. So there's lots of things that we can do for ourselves, for our kids, to help create that balance so that we're not dysregulating all the time, that we can hold on to, um, you know, and, and roll with it. I mean, there's going to be times that, you know, as I say to my kids, you know, anxiety is not bad. In the sense, anxiety is adaptive. If someone's chasing you down a dark street, you need anxiety because you need to get into fight or flight mode. Otherwise you could be attacked. So you need to have a degree of anxiety in our bodies. It's not necessarily a bad thing. We need it to, to survive. It's just when it becomes over the top. And, and, and we need to let kids know that, you know, it is normal, typical. And how do we learn, how do we learn to give tools to kids so they learn how to cope with it? Because one day they're not gonna, they may not get into the college of their choice. They may not buy the first house that they fell in love with. They may not marry the person that they fell in love with. How do they deal with disappointment and stress of that? Not getting into the college of their choice. It's huge. They're so afraid of making that wrong choice. And it's even harder now with pandemic because they can't visit the schools. They can't go there and have a feel for it. So keeping that balance and it starts with us. We can't just tell kids, do this, and we're not doing it. Breathe, breathe. You know when you've been to the doctor and, you know, the women in this and that are watching going for a gynecological exam or the men watching, you know, you've gone for a prostate exam and they tell you, just breathe, relax. Seriously? You know, that's a bit of a challenge right now, right? So being empathic to our kids, being understanding. We need empathy in our world right now. It's very hard in this time that we're not, there isn't a, a degree of civility toward other people. So it all stems from us. It can't always be the, just the school doing that. It has to be a community effort. And that hence why you're doing this for the community at large, because we all have to be, we're all in this together. And hopefully we'll, we will all come out of this together. Viruses have come and gone and, the, and people have survived. Frank, great. Great, uh, great thoughts. I'm, I'm struck by uh, one thing and then I have a question in terms of clarification. What I love about your takeaways is they're very action oriented. So you're teaching me a skill, right? I'm 14, I'm in your office, I'm struggling with anxiety. You're teaching me these, these kind of skills. How do you then balance, let me say it differently. Do you, do you teach the parents as well as the kid together apart um, how, what does that look like in, in kind of a typical um, practice? In practice, if I'm not, I speak with my parents pretty frequently. And if I'm rowing the boat this way and teaching skills and they're not mirroring that and having continuity, then it's a waste of diamond time. And I don't care how much money people have or how much time they think they have, no one has that to waste. So it's important that that that's a collaborative thing. I often encourage kids to share with their parents. I don't always want to, you know, I want to give them some ownership of it. Um, but certainly it's played out with a kind of a, a team effort with that. Because, you know, it's great to hold as, as, a, as an adult to hold this and just kind of, you know, take some breaths with for myself, you know, it, even though this is a, a child's toy, um, sometimes we need something tangible to help us through something. Makes a lot of sense. I can see where um, particular anxiety can really become a familial issue if you can be, be, everyone starts to deal with it. And so 
um, in some ways just treating the uh, the identified patient, so to called, right? The, the the child that's been brought in. I could see where that would not. They may be reacting to something in the environment. That's why the environment needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. You know, and so like, you know, oftentimes, you know, looking at the whole system, not just looking at the, the identified patient, that they're the only ones with the problem or the issue. Um, and anxiety, you know, kids acting out in these days, whether they be teenagers or, or young kids, is that we need to understand what's driving the behavior. You know, depression for children, I know we're talking about anxiety, but depression in children doesn't always look like adult depression. Like they're not always crying or, you know, eating ice cream on the couch and isolating. It can be irritability in children. Irritability is a sign that there may be depression there. So parents need to know that if your child is irritable, first of all, don't diagnose your child. And anyone that is listening to this, don't panic. Certainly, if you have questions, reach out to the community, reach out to a mental health professional and speak and share those concerns with them. And, you know, better to be proactive than reactive. I guess the other strength of, of bringing the whole family into the process is um, there's less of a feeling of, of that child being alone, right? And so kids feel all kinds of shame and pain around anxiety. And so if, if the whole family is brought in into the Dr. Cilio room, so to speak, I can see where that would really, uh, really be powerful for just about everyone in that family. I can see where that would be huge help. Yeah. Right. And understand too, in my practice, uh, you know, parents also, when they bring their child to me, there's also a lot of shame that they experience, that they feel that they're failing as a parent and that they're blaming themselves or blaming their partner. And there's a great deal of shame about, um, about failing as a parent. And you know what, if there was a, if there was one book that, you know, cured it all as far as the parenting book, um, I wish I would have written it because it would be a gazillionaire, but unfortunately one doesn't exist. And so my approach, and I think many of my colleagues approaches is that this is not a room of shame and blame. It's about coming together and finding solutions. Yeah. Great. Well, we, we have three questions if Great. we have time. And, and one is, um, what inspired you to write about um, your books? you know, the specific topics? Great question. Great question. Um, they come from my work. Um, I might have a patient, I had a lot of sore losers, uh, kids who were having a difficult time sore, uh, being, you know, losing gracefully. So I wrote Sally Sore Loser as a, the name of the book uh, to kind of be the, the, the conduit to help them um, deal with that issue. My, my, I have a book coming out in April called Blossom and Bud that deals with body positivity. I had a young girl in my practice who was teased because she was overweight and didn't like her nose. And she was, she was seven years old and cried almost every day in my office. And so I, I created Blossom and Bud because Blossom is a sunflower and is really tall. And Bud is this little flower who hasn't fully bloomed yet. And, you know, they're made fun of in the book because kids who have you know, different body types or whatever often are subject to bullying and they're used in a very special way by the florist. The, um, the, medical, the parenting book for medical illnesses came from um, my own experience that I have a chronic illness called Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. And I was diagnosed that in my early 20s. So it's been, a, you know, what, 10 years since I had it, I wish. Um, but um, we would have gone with that, Frank. We would have gone. You have good lighting. You have good lighting in your book. So, so, um, so no, I wrote this book because I spoke across. I, you know, I spoke for the Crohn's Colitis Foundation across the country, and it just, I, you know, I spoke to so many parents, and I just wanted to create a book for for parents that have children with medical illnesses that are struggling because they not only struggle with the parenting piece, they struggle with, okay, now I have this on top of this that I didn't ask for, and it's more challenging. How do I deal with my jealous? sibling who's you know upset that i'm spending all this money on this on this or spending all this time taking care of this child who's ill so um so that's how um i came up whoever asked that question that's how my, my it comes from my my experience of my clinical work and of course everyone's disguised no one's no one's and we can get those on amazon 
You can get them on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, any other bookstore. Any local? Is um, it? Do we? I th I don't know if Bookends and Ridgewood has it. I'm not sure, but you know, I don't know if anyone's really going. We're signing there, Frank. I I've done a signing. I do all my signings at Barnes and Noble. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> another question. When, it, when your loved one already struggles with anxiety, what's the best way to help them deal with COVID so their fears don't become overwhelming? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I, think, I think that if the loved one is, a, I'm assuming the loved one is um, a significant other, um, like a, a husband or a wife or a partner of some sort, um, I think that Sometimes we have to actress it up or actor it up around our kids when we're having, when we're freaking out. You know, I do say that to my parents. Sometimes you gotta be the Julia Roberts or the Robert De Niro of acting because if you're gonna exude all this anxiety in front of your kids, it's not gonna be very helpful. It's really hard and maybe, maybe you know, certainly present the facts um, and that, you know, um, if, you're, if it's a partner or, or or someone in your life that you love very much, maybe they, maybe if you've tried to talk to them about it and, and it's resulted in a wall or fights, maybe it's best to maybe bring in a third party. I'm not saying long-term therapy, but maybe bringing someone to kind of help balance out some of that anxiety and worry that someone is having in the family. Love that, great, great thoughts. And I think we have time for one more. I'm sorry, I can't get to all the questions. And that is it, advice for parents who see light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to COVID, the vaccine, specifically dealing with school, right? Some, some schools are opening up a little more, some aren't. But, you know, I, I'm thinking optimistically come September, we're back to somewhat of a normal, whatever that is, right? It's to a much more normal routine. That's right now um, what I'm thinking, but it, this person is looking for any specific concrete advice because we still have four months of school and it's been 12 months. And, and quite frankly, I thought this was gonna last two weeks. Yeah. When, we, when, we, when we got the news to shut down, I was two to three weeks and you know, it's been a long haul for all of us and including me, but, this, this person is just, what are some concrete steps so we don't self-sabotage between now and June and to get us, to get them through? Yeah, I think empathy. I think it's letting kids express their negative emotions about this. Um, oftentimes we don't want to deal with that as a negative emotions because it's too, we're maybe feeling that and it's too strong for us to handle. So allow them an outlet that has boundaries around it. They can't start throwing things around and, you know, taunting you or other family members. So allowing the negative expression of emotion. Um, understanding that, you know, presenting, it depends on the age of the child or whatever, but presenting like some of the hard facts, like new vaccines are coming out, some of the data that is promising and hopeful. Many of the schools, I don't know where Ramsey's at, but many of the schools are extending their school day. They are opening up to five days a week. They are um, going back full time, some. Um, I think also sometimes it's been helpful to have a calendar, especially for younger children, because they can concretely say, okay, we're crossing off the day, we're getting closer to, you know, perhaps a, 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 a happy event or, you know, or something to look forward to. Unfortunately, there's really no magic in like, you know, in the sense of it is what it is. And so how do we, how do we, how do we balance this out? How do we make it a better situation? How can, how can I, as a parent, make it better for you? You're struggling in math. How can we, how can we make this better for you? I know you miss your friends. How can we create something that maybe um, balances out that loneliness or that isolation? Um, you know, the hybrid learning um, can be challenging. And, but in my experience, I've seen kids do better with it to, some, to the most degree. I mean, not, not every kid, obviously. Um, it's very challenging. I don't even understand when they're explaining to me, A, B, D, I don't I'm like, I don't know what that is, you know? Oh, I could tell you, cause I have 49 different schedules that we've developed in <laughs> Ramsey. So, and there's still one more to go. We still have one more phase to go, so. Right. I mean, I think the concrete thing, <laughs> empathy, allowing expressions of emotions. How are we, how are they kind of not just 
balancing out their life with school? How, what else are they doing in their lives? Are they eating right? Are they sleeping right? Are they, are they, are they engaging in activities? Are they involved in extracurriculars that you're safe and comfortable with? Are they seeing people? Are they, are, you know, where, where are they kind of having some, some um, respite from, you know, the school and, you know, this difficulty? And parents need that respite as well, because again, they're being asked to, to be teachers and to teach things that they never heard of in their lives. So um, there's no clear, I mean, it would, I'd have to think about that some more, but just, you know, what I've said is just allowing expression of emotion containing some of that negative acting out. Um, if there is acting out, if you have teenagers, be very mindful about substance abuse. Substance abuse is high right now. Um, and cutting is also high, self-injurious behaviors. So we wanna be aware that children may be hurting themselves and obviously suicide. I can't tell you how many calls I get. I got a call today before our session about a boy who threatened to overdose. And the mother said, what should I do? I said, you need to take him to the emergency room. He needs to be make sure that communicated to him that we keep you safe. And that's what we need to do. That's interesting because um, just yesterday I had a conversation with Michael about a com uh, an, uh, an elderly community member not attached to the school system who um, was dealing with thoughts of, of suicide and trying to get him help. He's been very isolated, unemployed. He's in his 60s no family so luckily someone reached out you know or stigma free is working in ramsey that they knew who to contact but th that is the second th that is the second person elderly person that i've had to work with in the past two weeks about thoughts of suicide mm. so it's 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 very difficult for all of us so the culture we forget yeah. about the elderly at times and their isolation and their loneliness. Um, but I encourage my patients, I know we're again, Zoom fatigued and FaceTime fatigued, but connecting with grandparents, yeah. you know, having dinners with them and having, you know, things, I know it's not the same, but you know, it's, you know, this is all we have to deal with. We're teaching kids resiliency now. We're teaching kids to bounce back. When, you're, when life deals you whatever, how are we gonna deal with this? This isn't gonna be forever. Right. Agreed. Agreed. And so well, September's coming. Can I add one quick thought, Matthew, on the uh, on the last comment about uh, starting in September? I, I think there's also a need for us to all pause and be mindful of everyone's anxiety. So we have the parents, we have the kids, we have the educators also are feeling anxiety and stress and and how do we do that? And so in that moment of kind of common humanity of, of educating each other, reminding ourselves that the fifth grade teacher is really anxious about school starting up again too. And so, and I know that's, that's hard at times. Mom is anxious, child's anxious. I think of it as in uh, three legs of the stool in some ways, right? It's the, sort of the family, the kids and the educators. And in this situation, everyone is equally stressed. And so, that common, as Frank says, that sort of that empathy, that common empathy of, of teaching each other and being mindful of the fact that um, educators are not robots. They actually have feelings and thoughts and families of their own. Yeah. And, uh, similarly uh, with kids and, and with parents alike. So it, we will hit turbulence. I think we need to kneel that. <laughs> we, will, uh, we will hit emotional turbulence. And so we just sort of need to fasten the seatbelt and, and kind of think that through. So, well, there's, thank you. They're, they're saying, thank you. They're saying that, you know, moving forward that, you know, after the, you know, the dust settles, that, that mental health will be somewhat of a pandemic of its own moving forward. I mean, I don't, it sounds gloom and doom, but, you know, certainly we need to be mindful of, again, I said this a couple of times tonight, being proactive versus reactive. If you feel like your child, if your spouse or significant other, a neighbor, an elderly parent is, 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 is expressing things or engaging in behaviors that you have question about. Don't, we often look at, we often look at these things and say, of course he's depressed, we're in pandemic. That doesn't mean, that's why that one third only seeks help. It's like, don't assume that that's just, you know, we need to do something about it. We need to say, you know, we need to take those steps. And as parents, that's sometimes hard because our kids are like, I don't need help. Right. I'm not gonna go speak to someone. Yeah. Certain things in life are non-negotiable. 
And hopefully they, they connect with a therapist that they can have that one-to-one -one time with, but we need to, to, to listen to what people are saying and also look at what people are doing. Action speaks louder than words. So it's not so much what people say, it's how they act. And they're gonna tell you, especially kids, they're gonna tell you through actions, not necessarily in words. So pay attention. That's a great point. And just a reminder, if you're in Ramsey, either as a parent, teacher, or student, we have the warm line available, which will connect you with a licensed therapist within 30 minutes. And we added three counselors on this year, specifically anticipating the increase in mental health. And so we have counselors available at all levels. So again, if you're, if you are in Ramsey, just know that we have those resources. And I can tell you right now, I'm committing those resources for next year as well when this is just a not one and done in Ramsey. Right. Doc, thank you so much for taking time out. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I'm looking forward to your new book coming out in April. I'm gonna sure pick that up. And Michael, as always. Matthew, thank you. Um, always a pleasure. Frank, uh, thank you so much for your time and your energy and your thoughtfulness. Yeah. Um, I, I um, will express one concern about Frank. So I know that Frank works a lot of hours. I know he has a lot of patience. When does the man have time to publish two books this year? Not one. I'm really hoping you're going to watch this tape back, Frank, and, uh, and practice some of, of what you're hearing because you're, you're, uh, you're unbelievable in terms of your production. And, and really what that means is a contribution to the mental health community of which I live. And so I thank you for that. And he's better, he looks younger than the both of us, Michael. <laughs> For gosh sakes, I'm going to get his beauty regimen. I'm going to get his beauty. He looks better. I'm thinking to myself, my God, Michael, you and I look gloomy on this thing. <laughs> we got to get better lighting. My complexion is terrible, Michael. For gosh sakes, the superintendency is really aging me. You know, anyway, Matthew, well, I, thank you. I wrote it off to my gray sweater, but that's not, I don't think that's doing it. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank Have you. a great day. Thank you very much, all.